We've invested a lot in research. We invest a lot in our design to make sure that it's easy to use the product and that it's compelling to use the product. We often say that the feelings we want people to leave with are that they feel proud, you know, that they did the right thing for the patient. I remember an early, early thing talking about when we were designing the product is there's always a right next thing to do for a patient. Patients who are very sick and needing to use a lot of healthcare resources, they're gonna keep needing to use healthcare resources, but there's always a right next thing to do for them. Welcome to Concept to Care, where we hear candid stories of success and failure, discuss strategy, and dive into the details that offer advice on what to do and what not to do in health tech. Whether you're a seasoned pro, growing your career, or just starting out, our aim for this podcast is to be relevant, real world, and tactical. We're dedicated to not only entertaining you all, but also empowering you with actionable insights that can be applied beyond the podcast, one concept at a time. This is Angela. And this is Omar. Welcome to Concept to Care. Hello, Angela here. Welcome to another episode of Concept to Care, where we dive deep into health innovations. In today's episode, we are thrilled to have Jennifer Rabner. She's the Chief Product Officer at Pearl Health. Here's a little bit about Pearl Health. They help doctors and providers deliver better care to their patients by changing the way they get paid. Instead of paying for each visit or each treatment, Pearl Health's approach rewards providers for keeping patients healthy. And they do this by offering the tools and the technologies that help doctors track their patients to deliver more effective care and to allow providers to make better decisions. This ultimately leads to improved patient outcomes and reduced costs. Jennifer is at the forefront of this transformation, and we're going to dive into how Pearl Health is tackling these challenges by engaging providers in the ACO REACH framework. Whether you're in health tech, product development, or healthcare management, this conversation is packed with insights. So let's get to it. Hey, Jen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Yes, yes, we're so excited. We've been uh, waiting for this one for quite some time, and we know you've been on the the podcast circuit, so we're very uh, grateful that you were able to spend some time with us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much for the invite. So we'll just start pretty simply. Tell us about yourself. Uh, Sure. So from from a career perspective, I have been in healthcare my whole career, so over 20 years now, starting first as a consultant for large hospitals and health systems, mostly in the realm of revenue cycle, so how things got paid for and how they got paid for correctly or incorrectly, Uh, and spent a lot of uh, that time also learning how to implement systems and what technology could do to help or hurt in in healthcare settings. After that, I, I took a brief little detour into biotech for about three years, and then Uh, I started my career in product management and value-based care 12, almost 13 years ago when I went to Athena Health, which is you know, pretty much the domain I've been in uh, ever since. Uh, and certainly, you know, feel like I found uh, the, you know, domain that I really enjoy working in. Uh, so that's how I, I, when I got into product management and, and you know, kind of where I've stayed. And I would say the real through line of all of this is, you know, really thinking about how healthcare gets paid for, what works about that, what doesn't work about that, what needs to change. And, you know, when I sort of discovered product management, if you will, it felt like such a good fit of being able to work in that space and being such a problem solver and also having really tangible outcome and tangible output of my work. So I so really love being in that space. I'm excited to talk to you more about that today. And then personally, I'm originally from Northern California, uh, but I have lived in the Boston area for over 18 years now. So consider myself uh, as bi-coastal as you can you can be. My family and I live just outside Boston with our two boys who are 15 and almost 13 and our dog, Duchess. And we are a very you know busy family with the kids in school, our jobs, and both of the boys play competitive baseball. So that keeps us busy for a good chunk of the year too. That's awesome. I think we need a headquarter in Boston because it's <laughs> been unintentional, but we've met with a couple Bostontonians in the health tech space. Obviously, probably not a coincidence, but I think it's funny. Yeah, there's a really great community here around healthcare in general and in all different kinds of segments and seg- sub-segments, but also just a really great community of people working in, in different innovative ways in healthcare here. So come on over. Um, Jen, you know, you said something that really struck me, which is about how we pay for healthcare. And that's obviously a really important piece. 
Um, can you tell us a little bit about payment models, how it impacts the overall healthcare system, and specific changes that you think are necessary? And maybe just give us a little bit of a lay of the land, because I think that'll help us segue into what you're sure. working on now. Yeah, and I think, as I mentioned, you know, really starting at the very beginning of my career, I've been very deep in all of the ways that healthcare is paid for. So all of the mechanics, the different parties, the processes. So we've spent so much time here. And you know, we really, as as you know, most of your listeners probably know, most healthcare gets paid for in what we call fee for service. So a service is rendered and then it's paid for, which sounds pretty straightforward. But then, you know, on a, a couple dimensions, one, there it's actually tons of complexity in between the delivery of that service from a healthcare provider to the patient to how it gets paid for. It's far from straightforward in terms of how things are, you know, what is what does anything actually cost? I don't know if anyone actually knows. You know, then how what is the contract? How many different parties are involved in adjudicating the difference between what gets charged and what gets paid? I mean, there's so much complexity there that although it sounds simple, uh, it's hugely inefficient, you know, wasteful. And then, you know, just you kind of can see where all of the dollars add up between what you know, we think something costs and what actually ends up getting paid. So I think that's something I've observed since the very beginning of my time. And, and so, you know, the world of revenue cycle, revenue cycle intelligence, process optimization, I think some exciting things happening in AI there. So that's one kind of whole area of it. But when I think about what does that incentivize? You know, and the scarcer our resources are around healthcare, the the more volume needs to go through this system. And so I think we've hit that point where the volume that's going through the system, which is, you know, the more volume, the more you get paid. You know, we can see the impact of that on physicians who are getting burned out, people not wanting to go um, into uh, being a physician, particularly, you know, seeing the, the scarcity of primary care doctors as well, because we're just creating this unsustainable environment. And that's um, not only to do with our payment model, but our payment model is incentivizing that volume. And then, okay, you know, over 10 years ago, value-based care as a concept starts getting introduced in lots of different shapes and forms. But I'd say, you know, spending some time in that space, everything still stayed fee-for-service. And then we said, okay, but there's also these extra requirements. We also have these quality measures. We also need to enroll a bunch of patients in chronic care management. Uh, and so we essentially, I think, even if for the very right reasons, added a lot of burden, more work onto this burden system. So the, you know, most of the money, the cash flow that is needed to pay people salaries and pay for the office rent and, and supplies was coming through fee for service. And then you have this extra work and maybe you get an incentive for that, but maybe it's not going to come for a year and a half. And so when I talk about needing to change the payment model, I don't think that there's, it's a solved problem and that there's this Here's the answer, because there's so much complexity, even in the traditional way. And then we add in value-based care. We're on a really good path, but there's just still, you know, a ways to go. I think everybody would philosophically agree with saying, well, we want to pay for value and not volume. How do you measure value? We've tried to measure value in a lot of different ways, tried to measure clinical quality in a lot of different ways. Like any physician would tell you how problematic that can be sometimes when you have a specific number that may or may not be the right number for that patient at that time, but it doesn't mean progress isn't happening. So I think we have a ways to go, but I think you know, continuing to work towards that place where payment is transparent, it's efficient, and that it actually does create, enable the right care model, if you will, to deliver that high quality care is where we need to get to. Yeah, there's so much complexity there. So I'm, I'm glad that you touched on so many of those elements. You know, it's not like going to Jiffy Lube where there's a menu <laughs> and you know what service you're getting and exactly how much you're paying for. And if we don't know how much it costs, it's actually different costs depending on, you know, how many members they have covered and their negotiating mm -hmm. power and everything like that. And it's interesting to watch the market because I think that Walmart did try to do something mm -hmm. where you do have a menu of services with a, a price and, you know, you see this consumer movement. I think that it's worked to varying degrees. So yeah, this is definitely a topic that I'm glad we're getting into and, and hugely challenging and nuanced and a lot of different players. And, you know, it also begs the question, which could probably be its own whole own po podcast of when you think about things, you know, you mentioned Jiffy Lube. When you have car insurance, you don't use your car insurance for the basics. An oil change 
cleaning your windshield, putting gas in your car. Uh, but we use insurance, which is a vehicle for risk and uncertainty uh, for even the most basic of services in healthcare. So another kind of interesting side topic there too. So you, you did a fantastic job of describing sort of the innovation that's happening on the payment model. And I think that's a good segue into what's going on at Pearl. So you are the chief product officer at Pearl Health. Can you, Mm -hmm. for the audience, kind of describe what is Pearl Health, some of the problems that are being solved, and talk about the technology and go-to-market? So Pearl Health has been around for almost four years now, started in late 2020. And I'd say the highest level, our, you know, our goal, the problem we're trying to solve, the opportunity that that we are, are partnering with practices on is how to bring more practices in to value-based care into these innovative clinical and financial models that continue to come out from CMS and other organizations. So how can we enable even the smallest of practices to participate in these models and be successful? And I would say, you know, kind of more specifically, it's, you know, that that we feel like we are at this unique moment in time, you know, whereas, you know, 12 years ago when I started in this kind of world of value-based care and population health, a lot of the things that we were doing at that point, which felt new and interesting and, you know, huge opportunity are now much more stabilized. We have a lot of data. We know how to use it. But now we've kind of over-rotated into here's a ton of information. Now you can manage your patients better, right? So really that marriage between being an innovative financial models, you know, creating that stability for, for clients in terms of payment and starting to kind of move ever so slowly away from fee-for-service, kind of marrying that with how can we take all of this data, all of these insights that have been around for a while and really think about what's the next thing to do with that. It's not about reports. It's not about checklists and having these heavy analytic tools. It's really about synthesizing all of that, distilling it into, you know, truly the list of patients who need your attention today, regardless of program mechanics and, you know, whatever boxes need to be checked, you know, in a particular program. We're really all about how do we help them be successful in these programs, but in a way that feels very authentic to to being the great doctors that they are. Okay. And so talk to us a little bit about the technology platform. How are you supporting, like what are the product offerings and how are you supporting those ACOs? Sure. So Pearl is actually uh, serving as the ACO. So we are the risk bearing organization. And then we partner with primary care practices to enable them in value-based care. So somewhat of a unique business model. I know we're going to get in a little bit to SaaS versus kind of being a risk-bearing organization a little later. But Pearl is the ACO. We partner with practices. And when they join us and we're together in a performance year in a particular program, we provide them the technology as the primary way to enable them to be successful. So that's something... You know, maybe unique or differentiated about Pearl is that we really from the beginning have made a strategic choice that we wanted to use our technology as the primary way to enable the practice versus it being kind of the secondary way or by putting a lot of people in practices or doing a lot of the direct clinical services ourselves. So we don't own any practices. We don't employ you know, any physicians. These are all practices who partnered with us. And then we provide our technology to them to help drive and deepen their performance. And so with knowing that from the very beginning and with a background in the more traditional population health management platforms where on the surface, everything's going to sound really similar. Like, okay, you're taking a lot of data, you're you're creating insights. Uh, the difference is, is who I built for. And so in a population health management platform, I was building at that time primarily for the people running the ACO who needed that wide view of what was happening across the network, where the opportunities were, you know, where the needles in the haystack were, as well as the large trends. And coming into Pearl, I knew that since we were the ACO and the risk bearer, I still need that information to run a great risk-bearing organization, but for what the product, the product was going to be for the practices. It was going to be for the people who are working with the patients every day. And again, they're not our employees. We don't own the practice. And so from the very beginning, we talked a lot about earning their engagement. We knew we were going to be a sidecar to the EMR. Our practices are on every EMR that I've ever heard of. So they're on many, many different EMRs. We knew we were always going to be kind of the sidecar there. And so we talked a lot about earning that engagement 
And that really led us to build a, a very different type of product than I've seen in this space. And that, you know, we, I always say we keep the waterline very high in the product, meaning there's tons of data, there's tons of analytics, there's data science, there's all kinds of program requirements and metrics, but those don't need to be exposed in the product, if you will. We take all of that and we distill it down into, here are the patients who need your attention today. Why do they need your attention? What do we suggest you do? And then they track that action. And then we can take that back into our data models and start tracking the outcomes of what they've done. So we have that segmented into kind of who needs attention today. If you finish that list, who needs your attention next for some of the, the things that are important, but not necessarily urgent. And so we've taken all of these different different things that have been in the market for a while around the data analytics and analytics and the program requirements. And we have all of that kind of under the hood of the product and then have built something that gets, you know, really great and high engagement from our practices and just really thinking in a different way about who the users were in terms of, of who we built for, even though the jobs to do sound kind of similar of, you know, decreasing unnecessarily, unnecessary medical utilization doing well on quality metrics, reviewing for accurate risk coding, you know, all of those kinds of things, all similar jobs, but we're doing them in a little bit of a different way. So Jen, that, that's really helpful. And can you tell us a little bit about Pearl Health and how you think about go to market? So kind of hand in hand with what I was just uh, discussing around really trying to be tech first in our approach to supporting enablement. When we were founded in 2020 in the middle of, you know, uh, our world being remote, We started targeting smaller independent primary care physicians, but across the whole country. So we didn't say we're only going to go into this state or that state or only for practices on this EMR or that EMR. Uh, So in that sense, you know, we've really kept uh, the, the practices that can join Pearl, you know, pretty broad, if you will. But we started with those smaller independent primary care physicians, many of whom were still in the middle of, of figuring out how the impact of COVID was going to um, hit them, especially in a fee-for-service world when people aren't able to come in and, you know, or, or can't do telehealth or telehealth was a difficult transition, watching revenue also decrease. So this not only, you know, at that time, you know, was a resonant message, but it was also an opportunity for some of these smaller practices to start joining some of these innovative models out of CMMI, like ACO reach. And so it enabled us to, you know, to to go um, very broad in our approach of who joined us in, in ACO reach and who were our initial users of of the products. That was our kind of 2022 cohort. We met them all over 2020 and 2021, started in the program in 2022. And then from there, as we've expanded, you know, even further across the country, we're currently in 43 different states. We got a lot of organic pull from different kinds of physician groups. So starting to see larger physician groups interested in participating and and doing so in kind of the Pearl way, started to see more of this kind of general, you know, different kinds of groups that aggregate physician groups. So IPAs, IDNs, CINs, MSOs, kind of alphabet alphabet soup (laughs) of all of these different kinds of organizations. So we started to get uh, a lot more familiar with them, started to sign more of those for the 2023 performance year and this year in 2024. And then more and more, you know, we're now starting to talk to health systems. So starting with, you know, smaller regional health systems, starting to get interest even from some of the bigger ones out there as we're starting to see, you know, the health systems know they really need to invest in value-based care and are looking for partners to help them do that. So so really started with the small independents and have really been able to grow our footprint as well as our product, which, you know, really is, is somewhat size independent in terms of how we do what we do. Of course, there's different kinds of things that a larger organization might need. But I've seen us kind of grow in the last couple of years, you know, higher in in kind of vertical growth as we get into larger and more complex organizations. You talked about the alphabet soup of healthcare, which always cracks (laughs) me up. (laughs) We're almost as bad as the federal government. But you, you touched on the ACO REACH program Um, which stands for Accountable Care Organization, Realizing Equity, Access, and Community Health. And so I'd love to hear from you, you know, in your own words, what, like, how do you define that? 
and then how it differs from other accountable care type organizations. Great. Well, I would say when I started talking to what became uh, Pearl Health in 2020, I had been familiar with you know some of the newer models that were coming out. And ACO Reach uh, was formerly known as the Direct Contracting Entity Program, or DCE, and it was converted to ACO Reach with a couple changes in 2022. So been exciting journey, kind of watching watching some of that evolution as well. But I will tell you the things about ACO Reach that were both compelling to me and that I think are materially different from prior models like Medicare Shared Savings Program, which, you know, still very much ongoing, multiple tracks. And there have been a few other, you know, the the uh, pioneer ECO model, next gen model. The two major differences in ECO reach, there's lots of mechanical differences and kind of program requirement differences, but the two big differences to me are that it is a capitated model. So it's where Medicare is converting fee for service payments into a monthly payment for physicians. Uh, been on kind of a ramp starting, you could go 10% capitated, so you'd have a 10% reduction in your fee for service amounts on your your explanations of benefits that you would get. And then you would get that 10% in the form of a monthly payment from from Pearl. So we get the money from CMS and then would distribute that to our practices. And then it was 20% and 50 now coming to 100. So kind of a ramp there in terms of capitation. But that was very exciting to me. And also uh, the first time that that's been in one of the official ACO models. So really starting to flip that script, moving to proactive you know, care, stabilizing revenue, which is, you know, very welcome after after the volatility of the last few years and just the volatility of fee-for-service period. And I would say the second big change is the quality measure kind of profile and, and reporting process. So all ECO models have, you know, been a big evolution over the last 12 years, but there are a number of different clinical quality measures at one point, I think up to, I think it was 32 or 33 in in MSSP and I believe next gen. And in ACO Reach, it's three clinical quality measures and one customer satisfaction or kind of patient satisfaction measure. And those three clinical quality measures, instead of being measures where I need a lot of clinical quality data, there's tons of manual entry, chart chasing, all of those different kinds of things that are inherent in quality measures today across all kinds of programs. There are three clinical quality measures, all based on keeping people out of the hospital, and they're all claims-based. And so Medicare has the data they need to calculate the you know, how a a particular ACO is doing based on claims alone. So it eliminates uh, a lot of the reporting burden, you know, that is very, very time consuming for for an ACO, as well as, I always call them kind of the roll-up measures. So if you're doing all of those other things, keeping blood pressures low, keeping diabetics healthy with low HbA1c's, putting people on the right medications, you're keeping people out of the hospital. So they're kind of the ultimate quality measures, if you will, but it's it's a very different landscape to build in and to operate in as well. So we're excited to see how CMMI continues to evolve on those paths. That's cool that you've been on this journey as, you know, these uh, models evolve and get updated. Can you talk a little bit? So you were saying that for Pearl, you started off serving, you know, provider groups, and now you're entering into health plans, some of the maybe smaller regional ones. How does the product differ or stay the same when you're serving a physician group versus if you're serving a health plan under the ACO REACH model? Yep. So we, so there's the, we have the smaller physician groups, larger physician groups, some small health systems, and their product experience is all quite similar. It's all, you know, again, the patients who need attention today, there might be a lot more patients. I would say as we move into bigger organizations, there's different ways people divide work. I take this issue, I take that issue, I take this, you know, pot of doctors, you take this pot of doctors. So looking at how we really efficiently segment work, and then the more people who are doing that work, their managers are going to need those roll-up views. They want to be looking at physicians across their networks to understand, hey, they're doing great in this area, they need some more support in that area. So I think that the the bigger and bigger healthcare providers we're serving, we get some of those extra needs, even though the say the kind of the core job, the core engagement model of the product is really the same. And then we are starting to also go 
into some Medicare Advantage risk where we're partnering with health plans. And then, you know, then it's a whole different program. It's not the ACO Reach program. It's Medicare Advantage. We're into STARS ratings and HEDIS measures, things like that. And so our goal with all of that as we move into different programs, which has you know, always been our goal, it was great to start and reach for a lot of different reasons in terms of how we built what we built. But as we move into these different programs with different requirements, the real goal for us there is to, again, do all, take care of all of that complexity under the hood of the product. So, okay, this, this patient is in this program, you know, they're with this Medicare Advantage payer. And that means that these are the quality measures that matter in that program. We don't need a whole Medicare Advantage module where somebody has to go in somewhere separate and do separate things. We want it to follow the same engagement pattern. Here's a patient who needs your attention today. Here is why, and here's what we suggest that you do. So it just gives us more reasons, if you will, to do that. But but the goal is all of that happens behind the scenes in the product so that we're really surfacing a patient-centric, you know, very action-oriented workflow rather than extra modules and more lists and, okay, wait, if I combine this and this together, am I going to get, you know, what I need to do? So trying to make that really, really simple, but... So we, we always say the, the product is patient-centric, action-oriented, and program agnostic. I love that. That's really, that's a nice, succinct way of, you know, setting forth the vision. Jen, you mentioned we're a sidecar to the EMR and that you've seen ever, you, EMRs you never thought you would see, you've seen. It's and- true. I came across names I'd never, never even heard of before, even <laughs> after working at an EMR company. <laughs> yeah. I often, I feel for the MSOs, honestly, when I engage <laughs> MSOs and there's just the stacks that they interact with at post acquisition. It's it's quite interesting. But let's talk like on the provider side, right? So you're you're, you're building products for the provider. How do you engage providers in, in the ACO reach model to ensure their like active participation and that they demonstrate they like use the product in a way that would actually demonstrate the medical economics required to make the partnership successful? I would say part of you know kind of twofold. Part of that is are they engaging? And second is, are we, are they engaging in the right things? Which is a lot of what we spend our time on of saying, am I raising the right patients for the right reasons? And then are they engaging? Are they engaging in a way that we can have term high value engagement? And then on the back end, we're putting all of that together to say, are we actually achieving those patient and clinical outcomes? So that we know that the work that they're doing, the work that we're doing is all in service of the right uh, patient outcomes, which, you know, one, one of the things I love about value-based care is how it's really a win-win-win. You know, it's good for the patient to stay out of the hospital. It's good for the provider. They want their patients out of the hospital and they'll get rewarded for giving that good, you know, kind of proactive care. And then the system wins because it's lower cost. So that's what we're always looking for about translating that engagement in that way. So, you know, how do you get them to engage, especially when we're not in the EMR, which is, you know, a challenge that has has been in the forefront since I started at Pearl, just from my, you know, my experience working in a, a population health management platform across, you know, with uh, health organizations that had a million different EMRs in their landscape as well. So, you know, one of those is really around keeping the product as, you know, we were just talking about very action oriented and so it, it doesn't feel laborious. It doesn't feel difficult. It's not a quote unquote portal. It's not, you're not downloading a CSV that it, we make it very easy to log in, see what you need to do, get that done and then move on with your day. So things like how long does somebody spend in the product? It's not something I want to optimize for. What I want to optimize for is how well did you do clearing those, those patients who are in a, a high urgency status today? And so a lot of this goes into the user experience. We've invested a lot in research. We invest a lot in our design to to make sure that it's easy to use the product and that it's compelling to use the product. We, We often say that the feelings we want people to leave with are that they feel proud, you know, that they did the right thing for the patient. We I remember an early, early thing talking about when we were designing the product is there's always a right next thing to do for a patient. Patients who are very sick and needing to use a lot of healthcare resources are likely, you know, they're going to keep needing to use healthcare resources, but there's always a right next thing to do for them for every patient in every different scenario. And so, you know, back to that theme of earning engagement, we want people to come in and feel like proud of themselves, like, hey, I'm taking care of our panel and taking care of all of these patients. I'm so glad that patient didn't uh, slip through the cracks. So we embed a lot of things kind of small and large into the product and how we design it. 
We do a lot of different reporting to them. We engage them with our customer success team. How are you doing? Are you engaging in the right things? There's things in the product that tell them every day or how well are, you know, how much are you keeping up? We give them goals in the product. So I'm looking at all of those different kinds of things. It all goes back to, you know, how we might do incentives for them. You know, again, in value-based care, the, the, Financial reward doesn't come for so long and it's, you know, so many different things are baked into it. How do we move some of that up into, into the day to day so that the practices feel like they're, that they're doing the right thing as well. And then lastly, you know, most of the things that need to happen in Pearl are not about what has to happen in a visit. It's about actually in between the visits, trying to make sure people are getting where they need to go, whether that's a you know visit with their PCP or, or potentially interacting with a specialist. But when we always say when we need to be in the visit, we're going to be in the visit every time that we can. So if you're in the appointment with a patient and we know something, about the patient that would be helpful for the clinician to know instead of doing the swivel chair, you know, split screen into Pearl or printing things out. We have partnered with a company called Vim, which has integrations with a lot of EMRs where we can essentially put information from Pearl into the workflow of the provider in their EMR so they don't have to leave that screen and can kind of know what we know, if you will. It kind of reminds me of, uh, I think this is, I saw this the other day, Athena has launched or is launching, might be in beta, a feature. It's like sort of like clinical decision support, but they're allowing payers to provide guidance directly in Athena for the provider to take action on. Is that something similar you all are exploring or yeah, describe the the, the difference, I guess. I am not familiar with that particular announcement from Athena, but I know there've been different things like that in the works. For a number of years, but it would be similar in that the thing, what is the health plan uh, trying to achieve? Same things as any risk bearing organization. They're trying to reduce unnecessary utilization. They are likely looking at a set of quality metrics. And then there's always accurate assessment of potential codes as everybody's trying to make sure that the the kind of benchmarks or budgets, if you will, are based on the the true acuity of the patient panel. So it's likely very similar in terms of, hey, getting what the health plan knows, which is actually in some ways more than the EMR knows, just like I happen to know more about what's happening with a patient because I'm getting total cost of care claims data. The payer also has that. So there might be different specialists that they're seeing. There might be quality measures that they're overdue for. There might be different codes that are are being assessed or or not assessed, I guess, if you will, out there in the rest of that patient's experience. And so getting the data into the workflow, it's probably a very similar job to be done. What we all put in there could look really similar or look different. I think, you know, we you know, in value-based care, there's always the basics, the things that you need to do for program requirements. And we have to cover those just like everyone else. And then there's the, what else would we show? And so some of the things that are unique about Pearl will also be going into that workflow, most likely next year. And so those are, you know, I'm assuming Athena probably has some of that as well. Let's shift gears here a little bit. Let's talk about like building in the value-based care space from a product perspective. And let's talk about features. So like, what are the key features that a value-based care health product should include to effectively support patient improvement or patient outcomes, and also maybe even the medical economics piece? So I would say, you know, the real basics, and I talked about this a lot at the beginning of Pearl when we were building the base of our our product. I mean, you typically in value-based care, you know, you data is kind of your lifeblood. So you you usually have that total cost of care claims data and some kind of risk-based arrangement. And so ingesting that, making sense of that, you know, is a is a core foundational element. I did a lot of analogies early on about building a house. So, okay, you have to build the foundation of your house first. So you have to lay down that data foundation. You have to start putting in some of the utilities, things like quality management. And, you know, quality measures are you know, most straightforward way to describe them are just numerators and denominators, uh, but who qualifies in a denominator who's compliant or not compliant in a numerator can all be a little bit complex, but you need those mechanics in, uh, you know, as one of the systems in your house, you need risk adjustment and risk coding, which again goes back to, are you accurately assessing and documenting all of the conditions of a patient so that whoever's setting the benchmark or the budget you have 
It knows about the right clinical acuity for those patients. And so those are the real table stakes. It's hard to imagine any value-based care product that's participating in risk, uh, a risk program with any kind of payer. Like you wouldn't need those foundations of, you know, I just need to understand cost trends. I need all that data. I need to be able to understand how we're doing in quality, where where there's work to do and where there's not. And then what are those risk assessment opportunities? And so those are the real basics. But then I, I think the the harder but more exciting work is then when you say, okay, well, how am I going to prevent unnecessary utilization and getting into those medical economics? Now, if you're in a commercial value-based care program, you've also got who's in network, who's out of network. That's one of the ways to reduce medical costs, not necessarily medical utilization, but medical costs. Uh, in a CMS program, there's no such thing as, a, you know, a, traditional preferred network. Um, The patients are traditional Medicare patients. They can see any patient or any physician who takes Medicare. So those are, you know, I would say kind of those building blocks, but then the, I think the real opportunity, the real excitement and something that I think is very persistent across models is when you can start preventing that unnecessary medical utilization. And that can take a form from you know, we're very focused on preventing readmissions, for example. That's related to two of the clinical quality measures that we have. Those are obviously, you know, poor uh, patient experiences as well as very expensive experiences. And so trying to prevent anything from from a readmission to trying to uh, prevent unnecessary procedures. You know, medications can sometimes be unnecessary, but oftentimes, you know, are necessary and actually recommended because those will help decrease the overall medical spend. But that's where things I think get really interesting when you're doing that. And that's where I think that persists across programs. Every program will have their own nuanced set of quality requirements, different benchmark setting, different mechanics. But every program will benefit once you start learning how to do that at scale. All right. So you've touched a little bit on the data. I think this is an area we wanted to go deeper because you have subject matter expertise here. So obviously, it's an important um component for developing these products. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about the data and maybe include like quality, accuracy, et cetera? Sure. So, you know, again, the, whenever you're participating in a risk-based agreement with a payer, you should have access to the total cost of care claims data because what you're trying to do is, is you know, reduce it. And so you have to have access to what's actually going on out there. So it's a great foundation. Typically, this data, though, comes, it's delayed. It comes in a big batch once a month. And, and all that data is a little bit late just by nature of how long it takes to, to pay claims. So I always think of it, again, as a great place to start. We knew that's where we were starting. So instead of limiting you know, ourselves like, oh, there's so many issues with it. We said, okay, but there's so much we can do with it. And so what can we do with it? So there's a lot of room to get started there. But but really, after that, you need to start thinking about what other data sources can give you the data you don't get from claims. So I might know on a claim that somebody had an HbA1c test, but I don't know what the clinical value of that was. There are some ways that that you can use claims and, and some non-billable codes to indicate what ranges they're in called CPT2s, which, which are great when they're used. But then, you, so it depends on what you're trying to do, but do you have some gaps in that data that you need, like the clinical values, and then, or, or data that just doesn't live in claims, like SDOH data doesn't live in claims. And so you would have to get that from somewhere else. Also looking for less latent sources. So when you're trying to be very, very actionable, if something's three months old, by the time you know, you can't really do much about that. I will say CMS has enabled an API to get adjudicated and partially adjudicated claims data. It's called BCDA. So we are able to reduce latency when we when we want to know something a lot faster <laughs> than we might know three months down the road. Uh, and then you have to think about what's going to be meaningful and engaging to your users. I would say, you know, again, over the past decade, all of this data has become available. You can buy data from so many different places. You can tap into so many different networks. And I think, you know, what I've seen in the last, you know, year or so, as we talk about this, is also really think it's expensive to acquire that data. It's expensive to implement that data. You asked about quality and accuracy. Uh, no matter how good a data source is in healthcare, there's always something going on, whether there's missing data fields or why does, you know, from this source, it looks this way and that source, it looks that way. So it's never it's never inexpensive to get data. So thinking a lot about that ROI, whether you know, why am I getting this data? I would love to have all the data. Everybody would love to have all the data, but A, you don't want to overwhelm people with data. So 
we think a lot about, well, why do I need that data source? How much does that data source cost? What is it going to tell me that I don't already know? And that's how we really make decisions and, and are very careful not to kind of just kind of spew all of the data that we might know about a patient. We really do try to distill that into why do you need to know? What does it mean for patient care here? But but yes, I think data has become a lot more available, but it's still not the most efficient and not always cost effective to just go buy all the data from all the places. Yeah, it seems like we need the data to be able to do the right thing to drive the right outcome, right? And the data is disparate a bit. You mentioned that it makes sense to buy data sometimes. I imagine, you know, we leverage the HIE networks a lot for some data. The payer themselves have a wealth of information that would support us in this in this endeavor. Like, what, uh, where, what are the other sources outside of, uh, of that that like someone who's building this space would need to tap into to really do a bang up job? Yeah, I think, you know, first and foremost for us, given, given the nature of ACO reach was buying admin discharge transfer data, which sometimes is available in HIEs. It's available in you know, multi- multiple different ways. We, we tap into a couple national aggregators. And as I mentioned, we're in 43 states, so it's, it's difficult to, you know, we can't go to one HIE and get everything that we need. So we went to these aggregators first that sometimes also connect to HIEs, which makes it a lot easier for everyone as well. So that was our first choice of data we would buy because we really wanted, we needed to reduce the latency of knowing about a discharge particularly so that we could kick off the right readmission avoidance workflows. And so you need to know that information. So that was one of the first, you know, that we bought. I think other places, I mean, there's tons of clinical data exchange options out there, different ways to kind of get those on ramps into that information. There's buying medication fill data. There's buying lab data. SDOH is, I feel, a little harder to come by on the patient-specific level, but there are, you know, even some some free uh, geographic base. So you can do a lot of work, you know, hey, based on where this patient lives, we know a lot of things about availability of grocery stores and pharmacies and public transportation and things like that. I would say the real long road here, though, is when you need to get the data out of the EMR itself. And that can be very, very challenging because, yes, there's lots of new grade interoperability standards, but there's still work to do on behalf of the practice, on on behalf of us to go get it from all of these different places And then there are some data types, you know, for example, I would really like appointment data because if I am saying I think this patient is at high risk of going to the ED in the next two weeks and we think they ought to be scheduled for an appointment, right now I can tell the practice, hey, there's here's a patient who needs your attention today. We our algorithm is saying we think they're gonna go to the ER in the next two weeks for a preventable reason. And we want you to schedule that patient for an appointment. If I could text the patient and say, hey, here's some appointment times, that would be even better. But appointment data isn't, you know, one example of data in an EMR that's not actually covered by a lot of the, the standards that we look at today. So it's a, it's a kind of long and winding road as soon as you have to start going into the EMR to get any, any particular data. So that's where you really have to start thinking, what am I going to prioritize? Why do I need it? How much coverage can I get with it? What is the latency of that data? Wow, I have a lot of questions. This is such a great <laughs> conversation. So you talked about, you know, if if I'm listening to this and I'm, you know, earlier stage, I'm trying to be capital efficient. You talked about data being expensive. You also talked about prioritization. And so how might you think about the order in which you get this data, how you think about like the costs associated versus the ROI of this data? Can you have pieces of it or re- do you really need this ecosystem to really get that? picture to make it very timely and actionable. Yes, yeah, certainly don't want to scare uh, scare anyone off from doing cool things. I think it very much depends on what are, what are you trying to build? Who are you building for? So if you are building and you're going to, you know, maybe buy a practice or run a practice or, you know, connect with just one MSO as your pilot client, for example, that world all of a sudden became a lot more manageable. And so they're probably in one region. You can, you know, maybe go directly to the hospital and get the ADT feed. You might, you know, just go to one aggregator and be able to get that information. If it's a hospital system itself, they're going to be able to provide you a lot. Are they all in the same instance of Epic, for example? They might have that data themselves. So I think it's just about what choices 
you make. And so when you think about prioritization, it goes hand in hand with go to market. And we're going to go to, you know, Pearl, we decided to go to market across the country. So that gave us a lot of opportunity in a lot of ways that I think has really worked out well for us. And, and you know, we love kind of being able to, to meet any practice in the United States and welcome them in to Pearl. There could be different choices where you say, hey, I'm going to go just with this MSO and we're going to go really deep. And I'm going to do all of these different things and I'm going to learn how to do that and rinse and repeat and go to the next one. So I think that's where your your go-to-market is. It has to be hand-in-hand hand with your, your product strategy when you're talking about data. But I will say this gets better every day. You know, some of these things wouldn't even been possible to talk about a decade ago. Continuing on the thread of just like payments in general, payments sort of sits at, as an important component of this product offering. And so like what what are the features or like the learnings that we've drawn from fintech that drive improvements in payments in health tech? Well, it's it's pretty, you know, when we're talking about payments in our world, we are dispersing the monthly capitation payments to our clients. And it's it's pretty straightforward. You know, there's a, a set rate every month for every patient. You know, that patient list ebbs and flows every month for different reasons as all eligibility files do, but the payment itself is very straightforward. And it's, it's, you know, here's all the patients that are active with you this month. Here's the rate. We give them a statement and then we deposit the money, you know, straight into their bank account. So probably not, you know, leveraging all of the latest and greatest around FinTech, but we're able to just leverage, you know, the, the rails that are already out there to do that. And so, yes, if all healthcare could only work, you know, that simply, that's wonderful is, is I don't think we covered, but my last job was at a company called Hint Health which serves the direct primary care world, which is a membership form of medicine. And that's how simple all of their payments are, is here are my patients who are um, aligned to me and members this month, and here's what they pay. And and it's all really straightforward. So it's, it's the opposite of what I was explaining at the top here, when there's a million different parties involved and all these different rules, and it's kind of abstract and complex of how we translate from, from cost to, to actual payment. But I would say one of the challenges that was a little bit surprising to me in the beginning is when you think about these practices, they're getting all of their revenue in the traditional way, except for this, you know, for the most part. So they're used to that. It goes through certain accounting reels. And then they start getting less on their Medicare EOB in the traditional way. And then they start getting payments from Pearl. And, you know, we can do all the analysis and the data to show how, how you know, it's intended to keep them whole. It's not intended to be less than what they were making before for primary care. But it gets very, very complicated from an accounting standpoint and from, you know, them just looking like, hey, am I, am I making the same? Their cash flow is so important. So I would say we deliver them the, the money in a very straightforward way. But because it's so different from the rest of their receivables, that can be complex in the beginning. So something that we we really support them through as they're as they're new to Pearl. I've, I've, I'm someone who's spent a lot of intimate time with Stripe and their APIs and their documentation. And yeah, and Angela's shaking her head because I'm like kind of a nerd about it. And I, I often look at their documentation and then I try to compare it to the, the documentation of other healthcare <laughs> products. And I'm just always so, God, I wish... Subscription, oh, it's just so easy, so nice. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's, it's so easy that it's almost too easy. <laughs> it's it's too different from, from the rest of the way things are paid. But as, as soon as we kind of get a few months under our belt, things, things settle down. Let me ask you about AI and your opinion on it being a tool when we're thinking about building value-based products. I absolutely think that it has has a role, will continue to have a role. I think particularly as we look at scaling, you know, these increasingly scarce resources and think about, you know, really value-based care, expanding the care model to be much more longitudinal than this kind of transactional model. It really does start begging the question of, do humans always need to be the initiators of everything that's happening in this sort of, you know, multi-touch point type of model? And so, you know, for us at Pearl, in terms of the world of just general advanced data science, you know, we've started by employing machine learning models to this big wealth of data that we get from Medicare to, to you know, basically discover patterns, correlations between data. It's how we do some of the predictive work we do. Like we think this is a patient who has a high likelihood of going to the ED in the next two weeks. So that's where we've really started with all of that. But in terms of the, you know, where do we go next? Where do I think AI could have a role is that, you know, a lot of what we're trying to do, again, is trying to make sure that patients get where they need to go at the right time. 
and that people aren't following through the cracks, which at the end of the day involves scheduling, whether that's with a PCP or a specialist or, you know, down the road, you know, are there certain orders we would tee up, you know, those kinds of things. And I think that's a really great place for automation and, you know, potentially AI as we go into that process. It's not exactly like a an easy admin task that that can just be completed because we're talking about where the open slots in a schedule, which are kind of all locked in those in those EMRs as we were talking about, what is the patient schedule like and finding, you know, the right time in the right place. But I do think that's a place that I'm looking forward to really exploring how do we how do we start taking some of the the manual work and the phone call back and forth and all of those different things to to automate. And I think AI has an exciting role there. And then the second place is you know, we're talking a lot about data, talking about how expensive data is and how it can be so challenging, still so valuable. But I think the best source of data is the patient. And there's so much, so much that I think we're going to be able to learn by getting data from a patient that doesn't always have to be like I put a wireless, you know, blood pressure monitor on you. Sometimes that might, you know, might be the right answer. But I think there's so much that we can learn from the patient that, you know, really can complement, supplement, strengthen clinical data that we have, but about how they're feeling, reported symptoms, you know, what are the trends and the patterns and some of those things too. So I certainly think it has a role. I think that that certainly will be part of our future. And I think there's some unique ways uh, to think about doing that in value-based care specifically. Jen, earlier in the conversation, you mentioned you joined Pearl like fairly early, if not at the beginning. So let's talk about building products zero to one. What are the key steps and challenges you face when building healthcare products from scratch, especially in a captivated environment? Like how has that been applied to Pearl Health? Yeah, great question. So when I kind of think back to to joining Pearl, so I I was definitely there when there were uh, under 10 people. So I think I was employee seven or somewhere thereabouts where it was a really small group. And what compelled me to come to Pearl were really two things. So we talked a little earlier about the big differences of ACO reach versus other programs. And I thought it it sounded like such an exciting way to build in health tech when there were there was you know, a little more flexibility, if you will, about what we could build because it was a capitated environment and the way the quality measures were constructed, it it felt really exciting to me to build in that world, kind of leveraging everything I I knew from my time at Athena and population health management, building in a new environment. And then the second thing was building a product from scratch, because I had never done that in both of my product leadership roles prior to joining Pearl. I had come into a product actually working with the founders of those products, which is a whole unique experience in and of itself of coming in to assume product leadership on a product that someone else built. Um, and so those are great experiences where I learned a lot of different things uh, in that way. But this was something I just hadn't done. And building something uh, from the ground up felt like a really nice uh, evolution next step uh, for me in my career. So I would say when I reflect back on that time and other people ask me about building from zero to one and what you need to think about, I think a lot of it depends, assuming that you're in a, a you know, mate, you're assuming most of the time you're in a brand new company, you could be in a bigger company building a product from scratch. But you have to think about what thesis are we starting with? Are you starting from a a market thesis where there's a market opportunity that you want to take advantage of and you you want to, to have tech be the primary or a major contributor into how you're going to tackle that market opportunity, which is how Pearl started? Or do you have a tech thesis where you have some really cool technology, you have something new and you want to apply it to a market? And so both of those are are really interesting ways to start building from zero to one. So starting with the market thesis, it was just really important to nail down what success was going to look like, what, you know, starting from the outcome, you know, and and what were those outcomes that we were going to achieve and nailing that down with a company. Obviously, there's some North Star metrics, but what would be the most important things in, in the first year? If you're in any kind of funding environment where either you're trying to get internal funding from, you know, your big company to continue or you're going out into the market, what are you going to, what story are you going to want to tell? What are those proof points? So you need to know that from the beginning. And, and I think a market thesis too is generally pretty broad. So how do you refine that down into how are we going to enter the market? Who are we going to build for? And then really, really thinking about what is going to make you differentiated? What is something that you're going to be able to say, this is something that we do or the way that we do it is very, very different from everyone else out there. And so there's a lot of refining 
into, okay, what, you know, what are the most important things? And one of the things I did pretty early at Pearl that I think anybody should do, regardless of what product stage you're in, is writing product principles, which is not a product strategy. It's not a product roadmap, but I talk about them as the guardrails. What are, what are the things that are going to be important to us? What are the things that are going to make us different? And when I have a choice of two paths, what are the, what are the product principles? Where do they lead me to? So when I say things like being patient centric, that's one of our product principles. And so when we build, I'm not building to just check a box on a requirement. I need to build in a part, a patient centric way. I think when you're building with a tech thesis, you have to do the opposite and then go to find your market <laughs> and say, well, who is going to buy this? Are, why would they pay? What would they pay? What's the business model? around this. And, and so, you know, both of them are just very di- different starting points. And I think when you're building zero to one, know which one you're starting in and then know which questions you have to get answered with the rest of your team. It's not just yours alone to answer. You need to make sure you're aligned on, on what are the metrics, what are the business outcomes that are going to be most resonant with both our clients and the people paying for our product. And anybody who might need to invest in or kind of give the the go no go on what you're doing. Oh, and I was gonna say too, one of I think in either situation, the thing not to ever skimp on is talking to your users and your buyers. And sometimes your users are your buyers, sometimes they're not, but that's not a step to skip. They you will you will not leave any conversation with someone without learning something that changed in a big or small way a decision that you might make that day or or down the road. So something to not skip in any part of product development, but zero to one, it is crucial. Can you give us an example of a learning from a user where it changed directionally what you were building? So one story that I remember very clearly from my first year at Pearl is that one of our initial customers was a small practice, is still a small uh, practice who's, who's still with Pearl, which I, I love that we have clients that are continuing with us for, for multiple years. But I remember speaking with her on the phone and she had her camera on and she was showing us how many different stacks of paper that she had from different health plans. And I have to do this, and I have to do this, and I have to do this. And then she was telling me she had 12 portals that she had to log into for all of these different health plans. And she spent most of the hour talking to us about the complexity of dealing with payers and all of these different requirements and all of these different things. And she knew every single thing, like, okay, now this one, I have to call this person and go do this. And so she she had sort of the organized chaos, you know, where she knew all the things she had to do. It drove her nuts. And when I heard her say, I have to log into 12 different portals, and then this one looks this way, this one looks that way, it really started to, to hammer home, and I would say reinforce the fact that we, yes, I could quickly build something that was like another list, for her and say, hey, do this, do this, do this. And it was at that moment, even though care gaps had been, you know, part of my lexicon the entire time that I've been in, in, you know, kind of value-based care world. And I said, you know, we're never going to have that in our product. We're never going to have a list called the care gaps list or this care gap or that care gap, because it, it puts everything down into that checklist and another stack of paper on her list. And I do remember that. So it was just so powerful and it really reinforced and kind of brought to the surface a lot of that, uh, the reason why we needed to be a patient centric platform and be different and feel different because we were going to have to earn her time in the middle of that crazy desk with all of those things. I can't fix all of those problems yet. So in terms of focus and prioritization, you know, we were, we were launching in this Medicare program. It was going to be something else, something new for her. And I wanted it to feel really, really different. I wanted her to be able to log in really easily, of course, since she was talking to me about all of her different passwords. But I wanted her to feel like that was something different and that it was about taking care of patients. And I wanted her to leave feeling good and proud and not rolling her eyes for more paperwork that she had to do. So that one always sticks out in my mind is a really impactful conversation. And that was, you know, just one conversation over the phone. I've since visited her in person and I got a whole tour of the practice. And, and I love the pride that people feel in these in these small practices and, and they're serving their communities. It's, it's such a cup filler uh, to go talk with them. And it doesn't, you know, we all, all of us have worked in health tech for a long time. I don't think that her experience is unique, right? And so like, that's just so great that you were able to do something about that problem. 
And it's one of the the most fun parts of building zero to one is that you do have a blank slate, which can be alternately terrifying and really exciting. Let's talk about building products in risk-based versus traditional SaaS. You know, maybe help us understand the difference when you're thinking about prioritization and customer success and how does that tie in with product success? Yeah, I think it is very different to build as a risk-bearing organization rather than than pure SaaS. I mean, there's a lot of things that about building are, are the same. But, you know, one thing that is so unique is that because we're the risk bearer and then we sign practices to, to participate with us in that risk and in this program, they don't pay us to, to use the product. And that can work out in your favor and it can present challenges because in our favor, you know, there isn't that, well, I don't think your product is worth this. I'm, you know, negotiating on price in that way. And then the harder part is nobody bought it. And so, you know, when somebody, when you spend money on something, you want to get a lot out of your investment. And so it does change sort of how you engage with your customers. But it also, in our world, not only do they not pay us, but we pay them. And so it just completely changes the whole relationship with a client where, you know, on one day I could be explaining their capitation to them. And the next day I'm talking to them about three patients uh, who are algorithm flagged as, you know, potentially going to the hospital in the next month. And so it does change the relationship with the client a lot. And then in terms of how we build, I think, you know, there's also a little more of the dynamic when you're in a SaaS world, you're thinking all the time about top line revenue and renewals, which we always are thinking about. <laughs> of course, you know, our business and our revenue and our our renewals as well. But it just, it, it makes the business outcome very different because my business outcome in our model is to reduce the cost of care. So kind of a big, bold <laughs> goal there. It isn't to enable other people to do that and have them pay me a fee to do it. And so it's, It's just, I might be building some of the same things, but my mindset and the outcomes that I'm tracking are so much more directly related to total cost of care and succeeding in these risk programs um, as my primary business outcome, rather than saying, okay, I really need to make sure we're renewing or I'm adding modules so we can increase our PMPM, like all of those different things. So uh, not about one being, you know, better or worse. I will say it's been a little freeing to be able to build a product Uh, in this way, because I can align our product roadmap very squarely with those things, you know, with those, those business outcomes and those patient and clinical outcomes as well. So I have really enjoyed being able to build in this way. And then of course, you know, it doesn't mean clients don't ask for things. Of course they ask for things and we listen, we seek the information. We do tons of user research. We love talking to our clients. We do site visits with them and our product is better because of the feedback that they give us. That client I was just talking to you about, you know, with the big busy desk, she always tells us, she'll tell us when, you know, I don't like this. I really do like this and we love it. Uh, so it isn't that clients don't ask for things, but it's, it's just a very different way rather than, you know, Hey, we're paying for this and we thought this, and here's, you know, here's my list of things you need to do. I think that's inevitable. I think that comes the more complex of your product, the more complex your clients are, but I have personally really enjoyed building in this environment because it keeps us incredibly close to those ultimate outcomes. Going back to like putting our product hat on, you're running a a large product organization at a tech startup or a health tech startup. And you mentioned earlier that you don't really, you're not really interested in measuring that folks were in your dashboard longer today than they were yesterday. You're more interested in the outcomes. Um, So how do you ensure that in the product development process that everything is outcomes based and you're making prioritization decisions around outcomes? Yeah, and I I think there's been a lot of chatter about this in the last couple of years in the product world. And I think it, it, you know, maybe a little easier said than done sometimes, but I think it really comes to, again, aligning with your company. What are those business outcomes? I sometimes, especially in healthcare, those outcomes, you know, we're, I always say we're trying to do nothing less than bend the cost curve, you know, of, of the cost of healthcare in the United States. Those outcomes can take a little while to happen. So what are the right leading indicators? So, you know, maybe you've got the long-term a lagging indicator? How do you create almost a system of leading indicators to lagging? We've invested a lot in our framework of how do I how do I translate product engagement into, into patient and provider and pearl business value? And so we've invested a ton of time with that with our data analytics team, our data science team, 
I do have dashboards I look at, you know, every single day. So I spend a lot of time <laughs> in a, in my dashboards. I'm looking at how that engagement translates into business outcome. And for us, that means, am I reducing total medical expenditure? And so we have created a way to do that, which I, I feel like has really like revolutionized my ability to be able to make prioritization decisions, start getting really targeted instead of just saying, hey, everybody, our goal is to reduce total medical expenditure or even in a particular, you know, domain of spend. We're able to get very targeted about that, that engagement. So again, feel very fortunate. It's, it's, the most data empowered I think I've ever been as a, as a product leader. So I would definitely say, you know, understanding the, the, what is the business outcome? What are the lagging indicators? What are those leading indicators, but not just writing those on paper once a quarter in your OKR. Like those are the things we live and breathe, you know, every single day in what we do. And so I can tell you how long people have been in the dashboard. I can tell you how often they log in. It's not that I don't look at them. I look at those trends. I look at, you know, I think of them almost as the canaries in a coal mine. If if a trend doesn't go the way that I want, what's going on there? But what I'm really looking at every day is how how much value are we creating every day? And that I think has really transformed and really started to, to help instead of making as educated guesses or assumptions or using every all the data that I could, you know, making those best decisions at a high level, it helps us be a lot more granular and active about saying, hey, I put this change in the product. Are, am I seeing a lift over here? Am I seeing a lower false positives? Am I seeing this happening? And so uh, it's really still only the tip of the iceberg about what I think we can do. But I think it has been incredibly powerful to make the right decisions and be able to calculate ROI, be able to say, hey, I think we want to invest in this. What would the ROI be? And then when we do it, I can track it. And so I feel like it's not just helped me be a better product leader, it helps me be a better business leader. So it's going to be different for every business, but I think you have to really, really invest there, really partner with your, your business analytics functions and make sure that it's just infused in, in like the language, the, you know, the, the presentations, everything that you're doing all of the time. Jen, it's incredible that you talk about being so outcomes focused. I was wondering if you could give an example of how do you know that you know, you're having success and reducing readmissions when a lot of the times when you're trying to improve quality and bend cost curves, it's the it's the absence of an event. I would say number one, make sure you're working with a really great <laughs> data science team who can help help do a lot of this assessment for you. But I'll tell you a little bit of the journey we've been on around a very common use case of trying to avoid readmissions, where a classic example of if nothing happened that's the, you know, that that's the win. You don't want the patient to have to go back to the hospital after they've been discharged. And so, you know, that started the first, I would say it was the first data feed that we acquired, the ADT data, the admin discharge transfer data. And we would alert in the product that, hey, here's a patient who just got discharged. And we would have people take an action. And the way that we start there is we look at what's available in the academic literature. And, you know, best practice is to uh, get in touch with that person within two days and then schedule an appointment. Medicare takes it a little further in the in one of the quality metrics specifying for certain patients within which time frame those patients should have an appointment. Uh, but the key is to have that contact within the first two days. So we set this up based on, on that kind of industry information of, okay, here's a discharge. We are saying you should schedule an appointment and you should, do, you should make sure you schedule that appointment. You get it on the books within two days. And... Uh, and then have the appointment within these different time frames. So I would say that's a classic case of we, you know, kind of knew the right thing to do. And then we tracked the leading indicator of how many appointments are getting scheduled within two days. And so that's what we were tracking. We track it in the product. We let them see how well they're doing on that metric. And then over time, as you aggregate enough data, then you can start looking at the rates of people who had readmissions, the rates of people who didn't, comparing that to industry averages. But it does take some time and some data. So it isn't like you're going to have your full outcomes, you know, framework from the very start. This is where you know, the, the classic question of is product management an art or a science? I mean, there's science to what we just talked about. And then the art is saying, okay, I have, you know, you're making bets, you're making hypotheses, all of these different things. But that's a clear case where we had 
leading indicators until I had enough volume where I could work with our data science team, do a rigorous analysis and say, hey, yes, we actually are helping reduce readmissions, but you have to start somewhere. It's one of my favorite things to say when everybody feels very overwhelmed by how many different things we could do or how many different paths we can take is, is just think about where do we start? We don't have to figure out the whole thing right now. We have to say, where do we start? And usually that's what you have capacity to do anyway, <laughs> is to start, not to take something through to completion. So you know you, sh- you can't be afraid to, to make those educated bets backed with as much data as you can. But we did start by, by tracking lagging indicators until I could understand that those lagging, I'm sorry, leading indicators that led to the right, the right outcome. You hit the, your comment about uh, art or science that's in our uh, closing call. So it's it's uh, funny you hit that. Um, let's talk about you've mentioned you've actually given some very good stories about, it, you know, being patient and uh, provider oriented. Even I want to talk about I heard from you in a conversation that we had previously that customer success rolls up into product. And I want to understand, can you explain why that decision came to be and like, how that's helped inform and build product? Yeah, well, it happened, you know, a little organically all the way back in 2021 when we were a very new company and we did, you know, we did have customers. They were going to be starting with us in January 2022 in ACO Reach. And so we, you know, the management team said, okay, we have customers. We're going to have to have a customer success organization. We had somebody in our growth organization who had wanted to move into that space and I raised my hand and said, hey, she, you know, she can report to me. We'll we'll figure out, you know, how to build this, not knowing that this was how we were going to be moving forward for the next few years, because those early days, everybody, you know, everybody does everything. And I was happy to take that on. But it has evolved into a really, you know, I would say cohesive and aligned organization. So in my org, I have product and experience design, you know, on the tech front, I have customer success and an organization called Performance Operations, which handles any partnerships or services that we can kind of deploy at scale to also help performance. So you you could call my organization like the client performance organization. Everything that we do is all about helping our clients perform. So we always say, you know, we have the same goals here across this whole organization. We just have different roles to play and levers to pull to do that. And so we, you know, Strategic Choice of Pearl try to do most of that through our platform. And so that's where product and experience design come in. We have our people and customer success who do a lot of performance coaching with clients, which has heavy overlap with engaging in the platform. So it's not only customer, you know, traditional customer satisfaction. They'll they'll answer payment questions. They're responsible for renewals, all of those classic functions. But they do tons of performance coaching, whether that's something, a trend that we're seeing that isn't in the product that still needs to be addressed by the practice or... It's engaging in something or engaging in it differently inside the platform. And then in performance operations, you know, again, those can be partnerships, those can be services, but uh, it's also a great testing ground when we want to try something new, test a bet, uh, test a hypothesis, want to do so in a low tech way. And then that can be productized if it ends up working or if we try a partner and it really bears fruit, we can invest the integration into our product. So it's turned into just this, you know, again, very aligned and cohesive group of people where we just, we have the same goals. And in, I, I don't think all being under the same leader is the only way that that can be created at an organization. But I will say having those aligned goals at the top has been very helpful. It's incredible to hear about what Pearl Health has built thus far. I would love it if you could share maybe a sneak peek for what's next. So Growth is definitely what's next and growth in a lot of different directions. So not just bringing on more lives for 2025, which is very exciting, but also growing kind of vertically, as we talked about, into larger and larger organizations and then kind of building horizontally into more programs. So we talked a little bit about Medicare Advantage and also the Medicare Shared Savings Program. So just giving some different options and and being able to find the right risk tracks for providers depending on where they are. So we're busy getting the product ready for all of those different kinds of growth, just in volume and client type and program type. So we're doing a lot of work there. Exciting plans on how we keep 
deploying more opportunities to capture value. So, you know, leaning into those machine learning models that I was talking about, developing new ones, refining the ones we have. And one that I'm really excited about that we're just starting to pilot is really how to pull the patient into these workflows as well. So, you know, communicating with patients and, and doing, giving them reminders, those kinds of things, nothing brand new in the industry. But as we talk about kind of capturing that value that we're putting out there in the product, all of these opportunities, instead of just relying on the practice to be picking up the phone and calling the patient, it's where we can now start communicating with the patient to say, hey, whether that's a reminder about if, if it's a patient for whom our model thinks they're going to go to the ED in the next two weeks, can we be calling them and reminding them, texting them and reminding them about their practices 24-hour hotline? Can we take them deeper and deeper into that self-scheduling, which again, a long road given all of the different EMRs that we're working with. But I'm really excited to you know, essentially move into the patient being one of our, our users, if you will, and really pulling them into that workflow. All right. So last question, I, you know, Angela and I have come from specialty care environments. She came from kidney care. I am currently in heart failure and in the value-based care arena. And, you know, specialty care is undergoing tech-enabled services wave right now where they are working, innovating on payment models. Are there any exciting opportunities in the value space of healthcare that that is in need of technology product in the in the specialty realm? Of course, you know, my my day to day, I'm working with primary care physicians, I feel like I should be asking you both the question about about tech and, and specialist care and would love to learn from you there as well. But I would say from the, the kind of PCP centric point of view, there are absolutely times when the patient needs to go to a specialist. And that might be for a moment in time for a consult for a procedure. And then they're coming back to their primary care doctor. And I think there's a lot of opportunity with technology to help that coordination be a lot smoother instead of the the faxes and missed phone calls and all of the different ways that they, they communicate or don't communicate today. And then I think very interesting is when a patient actually needs longitudinal care from their specialist. So thinking about a patient with heart failure and the kind of relationship they might have with their cardiologist. And so thinking about the roles between those two, but, you know, really in either model, uh, I would say that where it's more of a procedure or a consult, it makes more sense to pay fee for service and they have tools that they're using today. So how do they coordinate with the primary care doctor if they're in a value-based model? How are they being measured? I think all of those same things would apply, nudges, mindset shifts that we're doing in primary care. And then when the specialist is acting a little bit more like the primary care doctor, do they need more of the things that we're building in primary care? How do we handle the things that are happening for, that are needed for the patient that may not be delivered by that specialist, even though that's really their primary point of contact. We see it pretty often in the model we're in where a patient, you know, will, will do an outreach to a patient or the practice will do an outreach saying, you know, hey, it's, you're due for your annual wellness visit. And the patient replies, I don't need to come in. I see my cardiologist or my oncologist all the time. And so how do we make this more fluid for the patients and between the providers so that there's that kind of clinically appropriate, you do, we do. And then how does everybody act in service of doing the right thing for the patient instead of kind of that siloed, you know, whether siloed clinical thinking or siloed financial thinking when we're talking about value-based care. So I would be excited to learn more and, and figure out how these two worlds can start combining a little bit. Jen, we have reached the very exciting concept closing call portion of our interview. And so the first question that we'd love to ask you is, are there any frameworks, methods, processes that you found to be especially useful in your work that others might find useful as well? Yeah, well, I think whenever someone says, you know, what's your favorite product management book, for example, I always refer them to uh, Escaping the Build Trap by Melissa Perry. Had the pleasure of working with Melissa at Athena, where she was for a while during the time that I was there as well as we were doing some kind of refactoring of product management there. And so loved that book, loved her teachings and, and kind of her way of thinking, which really opened up. Uh, a lot of different kind of thinking for me. And she has a lot of great kind of tools and almost workbook-like things that I think are helpful whenever I'm feeling stuck. You know, you can kind of go back to one of those and say, hey, if I tried to fill this out, uh, what would I say here? And I would have a little aha. So I do like that book and I have referred a lot of people to that book. 
And then there is another article and kind of presentation I stumbled across online that I could provide the link so you can put it in the the transcript. But it was a, a Denver Startup Week presentation in December, I think December 2019, And it was a whole presentation on outcomes-based roadmaps. And they have a diagram that I absolutely love that really starts with what are your, you know, what's the company vision? What are the company goals? And works all the way down to different levels that you can think about in terms of customers, customer challenges, and how eventually that forms your bets, your hypotheses, your epics, your stories uh, that you're going to work on. And I've used that time and time again. I've even done big kind of exercises with my teams, you know, on the wall where we have post-its kind of representing each stage of that framework. So that's one I've always really liked as well. So happy to provide that link. Yes, please. We will list that in the show notes. Jen, is there a tool that is highly valuable to you that you think others may not be using? I don't know. I'm still, I, you know, my to-do list is still on a post-it. So <laughs> not the most innovative tool, but I would say we use ClickUp at Pearl, which we also used at Hint. It's been around for probably over five years now, but we do use that for task tracking, but we use it for a lot of other things. And one of my favorite things to do as a product leader, when I want to understand, either understand what we're investing in and gut check that, or I want to explain to anyone else in the organization, it's just really a simple pie chart of where the time is going to what strategic initiatives. There's some tools and things I like and click up that help us do that more automatically, but it's a great way to look at the highest level of, you know, how am I allocating my portfolio really of resources against what strategic initiatives? And is that what I intended? Did things change over the course of the quarter? When I'm having conversations about trade-offs and and capacity and things like that, it's very helpful. And I particularly like a pie chart because it is a zero-sum game when you're talking about where your resources are going to go. So not necessarily the newest thing on the block, but I do like how ClickUp can help if you spend the time configuring it correctly, how it can really help give you those tools that I find very helpful as a product leader. Is the numerator denominator in that hours engine like working on that project or is it just like like portion of the quarter, like number of days, months, weeks? I've done it before at the highest level by by scrum team. So this scrum team is like 20 percent allocated here, 40 percent allocated here. I think with ClickUp, you can get a lot more granular. And however, the teams are, are kind of whatever they're using to to divide up their time and prioritize and plan uh, you can use. But even in a spreadsheet, if you, you know, however many scrum teams or engineers you have, even making high level estimates, I think precision is probably not needed in this. It's really more of the high level, you know, hey, we've got 40% as I was, you know, talking about what is Pearl doing? How much of my portfolio is going towards growth initiatives versus, you know, total medical expenditure capital? And so being able to talk at that level, I find really helpful to translate and also to manage and say, hmm, I wonder, you know, if we should be reallocating a little bit of what we're doing. And then we'd love to hear from you if there are any concepts in healthcare that really excite you right now. Well, everything in healthcare excites me. I I love healthcare and as challenging as it is, I can't imagine working in any other, you know, really any other field. But I do love to see anything, you know, that as we've been talking about a lot, that, you know, when you're seeing tech and service and financial model innovation all kind of coming together. I always find that really exciting. I, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, I worked at Hint Health before Pearl and the, the whole movement around direct primary care. I don't think I've ever seen physicians who are so happy and satisfied in what they do. I'm a direct primary care patient. I love, you know, my experience. So I like to see any kind of innovation, you know, whether it's specialty care, uh, pediatrics, Uh, senior care, um, so much exciting stuff happening there. But I have to say, you know, even outside the world of value-based care, I'm so excited to see um, funding and energy and ideas going into women's health uh, as well. And I think that, you know, understanding how much is actually not known about women's health at all different phases of a woman's life and seeing, seeing all of that come to life and start to get all of the energy that I see coming and the funding following all of that energy, I think is really, really exciting. So I love value-based care, but also really, really excited to see all of those ideas flowing there. You, you, you hit it earlier a little bit, but do you think product management is science or an art? Well, I, you know, as, as I think everyone would say, it's really both. I think that it 
you know, has to be science backed in the way that, you know, your products exist to, and most of the time, not every single instance, but most of the time your product exists to achieve business value. And the great thing about healthcare is you can build great businesses and do great things for patients and providers. So the science, you know, you have to understand your business. You have to understand your business model, how your product is contributing. Is it delivering ROI to your organization? And then that should really, really flow into how you prioritize, which again is easier said than done. But then the art is where you have instinct and you have bets, you have hypotheses, which you can be very also science about. But I find that's where those product principles have really come into play about, you know, how do I want to build a product? Not what am I building? Why am I building it? But how do I want to build it? What are those things that are important? And I think that's where a lot of the art can come into play. But of course, I think it's it's really both, but whether you call it learned experience, instincts, crazy bets that you're going to take, I think that's the part where you can really make breakthroughs as well. And last, but certainly not least, where can people get in contact with you? And do you have any shameless plugs? LinkedIn is always a good place to get a hold of me. Just write a little note <laughs> letting me know so that I can, can, can see that highlighted since there are so many messages out there today, but probably the easiest way. And then, you know, my main shameless plug is just to follow us at Pearl. We love to be out there. We write a lot. You know, we've had a few things published by different people at Pearl. We like to write on our own blog. We're always putting out content, but, you know, we just all really love what we're doing. We're really excited about it and we'd love to have, have all of you follow along. That's Jen Rabner. Jen, thank you so much for coming on to Concept of Care. My pleasure. It was really nice to chat with you both. Hey. Thanks so much for listening to the show. If you liked this episode, don't forget to leave us a rating and a review on your podcast app of choice. And make sure to click the follow button so you never miss a new episode. This episode was produced and edited by Marvin Yue with research help from Aditi Atreya. We're Angela Omar, and you've been listening to Concept to Care.